Hi, I'm Sebastian Cuccio, and you're listening to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. On this show, we dive deep to learn how things work at a technical level, and we fly high to understand visionary concepts and long-term trends. If you like Epicenter, the best way to support us is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're on a Mac or iOS device, the easiest way to do that is to go to epicenter.rocks slash Apple. And if you're new to the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Today, we have something special for you. We have a host roundtable discussion where Brian, Frederica, Sonny, Mayer, and I are going to reflect on what happened in the last year and also make some predictions about where we think things could go from here. This is something that you guys, our listeners, have asked us to do more frequently. And it's been hard to find the time to, to do these, these host roundtables. But I can promise you one thing. We're going to do them more often. We're going to try to do them once a quarter and if not, at least twice a year uh, because we really like doing it. Uh, every time we do these, we have a great time. And this was no exception. So in case you haven't noticed, there's a pretty significant bull run happening right now. As I record this, Bitcoin is somewhere around $40,000 and Ether is at about 1200 So that is going to color a lot of this conversation. And so we are making some price predictions, which is not something we typically do on the show, but we try to make some informed price predictions at least and speculate on where things could go from here. But to, to counterbalance that, we're also talking about what all of this fervor could bring in terms of negative attention to crypto and how the system, the traditional finance system, and also governments and nation states, how they could react to this tremendous amount of enthusiasm around crypto. One of the ways that governments could react is by uh, imposing stricter regulations. We're already seeing this in Europe and also in, in some form in the U.S., There's also the potential for stricter taxation on crypto assets. So we'll talk about that at length. Before we go to the interview, I want to tell you a little bit about OneInch. OneInch is my go-to DEX aggregator. And I actually used OneInch yesterday because I needed to make a little trade. And I was surprised to find out that they had recently done an airdrop and that I was entitled to receive some OneInch tokens, uh, which I claimed. And... They were worth uh, a nice chunk of change. So if you've been using one inch and you used it uh, in the last couple of months, you should definitely go to epicenter.rocks slash one inch and have a look and see. Maybe you've got some, uh, maybe you've got a late Christmas gift there waiting for you. So with that, please enjoy this conversation with all of the Epicenter hosts. So the first area that we're going to be discussing today is on the market cap or the the price of crypto currently, unless you haven't noticed, the uh, crypto has been in a pretty significant bull run uh, these last couple of weeks. And we have some predictions on where we think things could go from here. Maybe it would also be interesting to have just anybody, everybody like share a little bit about like how their last year was or like. Yeah, actually, I'd like to start with that. That'd be good. All right, let's uh, go ahead, Brian. Yeah, so we wanted to make an episode today to like look back a little bit on last year and you know, kind of catch up. We've done those a few times in person around conferences. Of course, now with Corona, it's been a long time since we had a conference. Uh, so we're kind of doing it remotely. And so we want to talk a bit about last year and like all of the things that happened last year. And, and I guess also especially like our own, the things we did and maybe that kind of impressed us the most. And then talk about this year and, you know, what's coming up as we're sort of at the beginning of what seems to be like another big and probably crazy bull market. Yeah, so I've had a bit of a crazy year. Uh, I think, you know, I think someone was asking me about like, there was like some, there was something that like, you know, uh, a couple of months ago where we're, like some talk I was panel about like you know what it's been like working through covid and how is like your work situation changed uh during that and I, this was back when i was still at tendermint and you know i was like well honestly a lot has changed this year but a lot of it wasn't from like covid stuff it was more just like other stuff that happened and so you know basically for me personally i i left uh this was probably like one of the biggest change years for me because i left uh my 
first full-time job that I've ever had. Uh, I was at Tendermint for three years and, you know, working on uh, launching the Cosmos Hub and Cosmos SDK and all that. And so I left about back in like June or July. And then from that, I needed like a temporary break from crypto. So I just started doing a bunch of random stuff, um, you know, working on some web of trust stuff, working on some education stuff. I made a Twitter bot of myself. Um, and then, but you know, crypto will always drag you back in. And so I got dragged back in, of course, and just started working on, so me and my co-founder, Dave, we started working on our uh, validator company called Sika. Uh, still running validators, but also just working on a bunch of more development projects that um, we're pretty excited for, for launching in 2021. So last year uh, for us was a lot, uh, you know, a lot of work on, uh, on Chorus One was kind of the main, the main focus. And I think it has been like, it, it was a really great year. We started with, you know, seven people, we grew it to around 12 people and there's the whole staking ecosystem is of course, like blossomed as well, you know, with so many networks launching, so much like innovation happening around that. And, you know, it's been kind of like very cool to like help many of these new networks getting off the ground. And then we've also done, been doing some work around interoperability. Uh, so we did some work on Cosmos, uh, kind of a, well, a Cosmos substrate bridge. And then we did some work on other kind of IBC related uh, projects. So we're doing some work on a cello Cosmos bridge and we've been exploring like Solana interoperability. So of course that's also still very at the beginning uh, where, you know, it's not yet sort of really affecting, you know, it's not yet been used, but I think in this next phase, that's going to become a significant, uh, significant thing as well. And yeah, this, the only thing missing was of course like the, the in-person team retreat as well, because we always did those every three months, we went somewhere. And that was of course, after the January one, a year ago, we didn't do any, but now next, I mean, we did them remotely, but now next week we're doing the first one in person again. So we're going all to Dubai. Uh, well, not everyone's coming, but about half the company is coming. So that's uh, really excited to like, get on a plane again and uh, like travel somewhere because I haven't, haven't been on a plane for almost a year now. So, you know, like my, I'm, I'm working with Brian on Chorus One and you know, most of my year was, you know, knee deep in onboarding some of these networks. And last year was the first year where Chorus felt stable where I'm like no no longer worried about the company surviving it's going to survive for at least the next few years and uh, it took us three years to get to this psychologically comfortable point so I feel really happy I also feel blessed that COVID did not impact our business in fact we grew a lot last year we onboarded maybe 10 new networks on a personal front like something really interesting happened on the regarding my body and physical well-being so in the in the christmas of 2019 i read this book called lifespan uh, by david sinclair i really recommend all the listeners to to read that book so it's a it's a book which is essentially about you know like the science of aging and how we may be able to control the aging process itself and so i i read that book and it was a revelation and then I did one of these tests which measure your biological age. So how old your body actually is as opposed to your calendar age, which is the number of years you have lived on planet Earth. And it turned out that, you know, like my biological age is 12 years older than my calendar age. So, you know, I'm 32, but biologically I'm like 44. And, uh, and like this data is kind of uh, outside the norm, like, at the complete edge of the normal distribution. So if you gather like 10,000 people, this 12 year difference, I'm probably like, I have the greatest difference between my calendar and biological age in a sample of like 10,000 people. So this was something really odd I discovered. And it, and this kind of observation sent me down a path of exploring a lot of different things. And so one of the things I've done is like, I've done some supplements and I've, I've done a lot of fasting in the, in the previous year. 
and what i also discovered on body is like the weight just started dropping off my body so i lost 20 kilos last year without even trying just having made some changes so and i feel much more energetic as well so yeah 2020 brought me some deeper realizations about about the body i inhabit and how to run it better so yeah i'm thankful to 2020 for that have have you done a second test on your biological age now has it changed so i i had decided i would do like this regular fasting for a year and the supplements for a year and then do the run the test so hopefully i'll run the test again in february of this year i'm not expecting my clock to be very different because as far as i can see we don't know how to influence the clock really well today and i am skeptical my changes would have done it but let's see <laughs> brian you 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 recently switched to uh carnivory uh how is that going i was i just wanted to kind of like yeah jump in cuz absolutely yeah so i mean i've i've also been interested in like diet and fasting for a long time and i've been on some sort of like paleo ish diet for maybe 10 years and you know probably like many people you've seen some of this like carnivore you know on twitter right there's quite a quite a few sort of bitcoin carnivores and so yeah i also saw those and it just seemed like an absurd idea uh but then at some point i decided to actually like learn about it and watched a bunch of you know, videos on youtube about it read some books about it and uh Yeah so I and then I I tried it out for a while 2019 and then actually felt really good but went to kind of eating back normally again but now I've been basically 6 months eating 90 ish percent carnivore probably but uh it feels really uh amazing so I I highly recommend people uh, and try it out it's I think the biggest difference is I know this is there's no food cravings. Uh this you know you just eat until you're full and then you stop like you can't really overeat. Uh and the energy is much more stable. So you eat like kind of what does it mean you don't eat actually vegetables and fruits or grains or you you literally just eat meat is that it? Well so I eat meat eggs. Uh I do eat like so I I do like some phases where I just eat meat next some sometimes I eat some um cheese as well and I I occasionally eat some fruit I don't eat any vegetables I mean fruit is just because it like it tastes like I don't notice any it doesn't if I eat like a little bit of like mango or something like that it does I don't notice a negative difference but it just it's such a different flavor and taste that it It's kind of you know you like you miss it. So Brian's officially a Bitcoin maximalist now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I had a third kid this year, so I'm still on the fish fingers diet. Uh, in terms of uh, you know professional um, stuff, we did a lot of things at Gnosis this year. So we launched the Gnosis DAO, the Gnosis Save launched Gnosis Save apps. There's two and a half billion dollars stored in in, in Gnosis Saves Saves now. We launched the Gnosis protocol uh, which is a new way of swap- swapping assets that kind of uses uh, the blockiness of blockchain to its its advantage um we launched the a prediction market framework that a couple of projects have built upon namely Poly Market and Omen um we took over Open Ethereum so basically the the client that used to be the parity client is now operated and run by Gnosis it's called Open Ethereum. Um sadly we didn't get to hold a conference this year so uh we we were planning to do a Debcon this year as well. I'm looking forward to getting back to that last year. Other than that I did um a decent amount of yield farming and kind of knee deep in the DeFi. Yeah, so basically that's that was more or less my year there was a lot going on and I don't really see it abating. <laughs> the moment. <laughs> I'm so happy that like the Gnosis prediction markets finally launched cuz I used to joke that Gnosis has built half the stuff on Ethereum except the prediction markets that they were supposed to. And but it's like this year they finally you guys finally launched prediction markets which is really fun. So basically prediction markets as most of you know is a regulatorily fraught topic. So basically you don't want to operate a an unlicensed prediction market. So basically we we tried to to get a license for the longest 
time. Um, and basically now that we have a license, it's kind of the, the ground has changed so much that, that a couple of fully decentralized projects were actually able to build on the decentralized framework that we had built. So basically we're not operating a licensed prediction market at this point. But it feels super good to actually have this framework out there and have people build on it. And um, I mean, you you can actually launch your own prediction markets on Omen. And I think the user experience is actually way beyond what anyone could have imagined, you know, interacting with a fully decentralized step would be like in the past. Yeah, like I'm pretty sure I saw like poly market mentioned in like mainstream news during like the election this year. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool that like, for me, you know. the personal failure is that people don't realize that it's built on Gnosis technology and people go like, oh, but you haven't launched any prediction markets. It's like, yeah, but really we have. <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize that. I also saw like the headlines about poly market, prediction markets. I had no idea this was built on, on the Gnosis. Uh, yeah, it's a Gnosis stack. So we've, we've, we've built a lot of infrastructure. <laughs> cool. Well, I guess I'll go next. Um, well, this year... It's been, uh, it's, it's, I think it's been a really fascinating year. Lots of really positive things happened. So on the epicenter side, I think for me, it was a year of, in some ways provoked by, by COVID is to, to make epicenter much more leaner as a company. And I think in many ways we've been able to do that and, and just have the company run uh, at a much more leaner pace. But what has occupied a lot of my time this year has been working with Adan. Uh, we had Simon Poirot, the president on uh, a couple of months ago at, and then it's the uh, Association for the Development of Digital Assets here in France. And that's been extremely positive uh, on, on a personal level, but also just, uh, you know, the accomplishments that we've been able to achieve there, I think, are like really, really great. Um, so we have like over 50 members now. And uh, what's, what's really encouraging um, is to see this initiative now go to the EU level, as uh, many of you are aware, I'm sure. Um, our listeners, I mean, uh, there is uh, crypto regulation coming both in Europe and in the U.S. And at least here in Europe, there is, there isn't, or there wasn't, um, sort of unified voice uh, representing the entire crypto space, uh, the entire like European crypto industry. And so this initiative uh, aims to um, to fill that void and to have a, a more a more unified voice in, the, in you know in the face of these regulations that could be quite. Uh, damaging to to innovation in the space. So that's been really great. It's been great to kind of focus my my time and attention on other things. I've been really enjoying uh, the work that I'm doing there, and you know, start it started off as uh, you know the thing that I think I'm you know more comfortable in, which is like structuring you know all of the all of the things in the in the organization and everything, all the tools that we're using. But now is moving more in towards uh, advising a lot of the um, a lot of the papers that we're writing, bringing my own uh, sort of technical and privacy-minded touch to the position, position papers that the uh, that Adan is writing, and a lot of this work is is also uh, being used for the for the European um, initiative. So that that's been really great. Uh, and I think with COVID, I when things started when things started going remote, uh, you know, sometime in March around that time. It was a really stressful time for me. Like personally, it was, you know, it, it was really like it was driving a lot of anxiety. There was a time there where I was like a bag of nerves, and uh, especially around the time that we organized uh, reset everything. But then, you know, then when things in like in the summertime uh, kind of cooled off a bit, and I was able to go on vacation and like take a breather, that was it, it helped uh, kind of take some of that some of that pressure off. Uh, I've really enjoyed uh, this year being able to. Uh, Spend more time on doing things that I like, like playing ele electronic music, for example. Uh, so you guys can't see this here, but my desk is full of devices and things that light up and instruments and things like that. So I've been spending a lot of time doing that. And yeah, I'm hoping for 2021. I I, I want to uh, what I, what I'm what I'm hoping to do is to be a little bit more because I've got you know my eggs in different baskets is uh, to, little, to be a little bit more structured and organized in how I spend my time in these different things and sort of like be, be a little bit more mindful about, uh, about like time spent on, 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 on different, on different uh, endeavors. Uh, oh, other thing too this year that, that was really beneficial and I hope to continue doing next year, but also is challenging in crypto because that's where most of the information comes from is like I really, I really turned down the Twitter. 
I try to go on Twitter as little as possible uh, because that was also, I think, felt like it before we were talking about like how, how much the phone brings anxiety. I think like that was one of the things that helped a lot. I actually tried to decided to start going on Twitter more again because I feel like I so I started like. I started this whole like geography thing because I was like, oh, there's too much crypto stuff on my Twitter. I need. I think that's else. the thing that I appreciate the most about my Twitter experience is reading your geography tweets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, this is sunny. Your your Twitter bot is amazing. No, no, not, like, not, not the Twitter bot. The, 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 the geography tweets. That's something else. No, both. Or bo- yeah, both. I mean both. Yes. Yeah. Well, the Twitter bot does a lot of geography tweets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and the Twitter bot is so good that sometimes I don't know whether it's the real Sunny or the Twitter bot. <laughs> I was thinking of like making the profile. The profile pictures are different right now. For the Twitter bot, it's my like epicenter, like blocky picture. But I was thinking if I make them the same, it'll really confuse some people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you're going more on Twitter. Yeah, I was, you know, I feel like, um, I feel like one thing I've, like toned down a little bit. I've, I've been a little bit less vocal and like, I feel like I want to get back to being more vocal. Um, like, you know, I like, just like sharing my thoughts and on stuff. Like, so I have like, you know, and also just like writing more. So like at the beginning of the year, I was trying to write more like blog posts and stuff. And I kind of like paused from that. After, uh, and then I'm, but I'm trying to like get back into that. So I have like, you know, after that, ep- after the episode we did with, uh, Martin on circles. I like have this like blog post I've been writing about circles and like, and I have a couple more blog posts like in the works that I want to like publish. And I feel like using Twitter is a good, like, you know, drafting board. Cause I think some of my like better blog posts actually came from being like Twitter tweet storms that then I, uh, turned into blog posts. And so I don't think I've like done that, those kind of like tweet storms in a while. I, I think, I think what I need to do is just unfollow everybody and then start again from fresh. I think I just I I, I think I just follow the wrong people. <laughs> Maybe that's yeah. the problem. You can also keep following them and press show me less of this. Yeah, that that also helps perhaps. Maybe you guys need to, to train me and coach me on on my uh, on my Twitter use. One Inch is a decentralized exchange aggregator that sources liquidity from the top dexes and AMMs to save you money and time on swaps. OneInch finds the best possible trading paths across over 20 supported liquidity protocols and splits them up across multiple market depths. I started using OneInch last summer, and since then, it's become my go-to aggregator. I use it every time I need to make a swap. They recently launched V2, which has a brand new API. It greatly improves their routing algorithm. And my favorite part about the V2 is the new UI. It's super clean and easy to use. These improvements ensure that you get the best rates on your swaps with the lowest possible response time. So the next time you need to make a swap, forget about getting the best rate or optimizing your gas fees. Make it easy on yourself. Just use one inch. And you can let them know that we sent you by going to epicenter.rocks slash one inch. That's one I-N-C-H. We'd like to thank one inch for their support of the podcast. Yeah, let's dive into these predictions. So uh, we all agreed that the first thing that was on everybody's mind that we would want to talk about is the current bull market. And so we're going to talk, we're going to give our predictions about where we think the cycle could take us. And uh, I think Mayor and Brian, you guys had some pretty accurate uh, accurate price predictions. Well, we didn't know about accurate. Precise, precise. Like, there's, there's an actual number <laughs> as opposed to like big number go up or something. So I'll, I'll just like kind of like read them roughly. But, you know, Mahir claims that the total aggregate crypto market cap will rise 15x. So approach 15 trillion within 2021, followed by a 95% crash at some point in the following years which is interesting. And then Brian claims that he believes Bitcoin is becoming a recognized asset class and will reach about 350K by the end of the year. Uh, and then he added on at the end, Ethereum will reach 15K by the end of the year. So, all right, do here, we want to like, go ahead and like give the defense of your uh, prediction to start with. This is an irrational market. It's a mad market. And like prices... I mean, there are no fundamentals in crypto, so prices cannot really go beyond fundamentals. But like ha- having lived through like two two crypto bull markets, one gets an appreciation of how crazy crypto bull markets get. And I think I personally think 
this is the 2021 is the big one where like this this bubble will become bigger than the what the dot com bubble was in 1999 and why i think this will be bigger than the dot com bubble is that this is the first post internet technology bubble where the information transmission has been accelerated by the internet and in crypto the speculator trader market is much much larger than than the dot com market so this will be a this will be bigger than the dot com bubble so if you think of the dot com bubble um, that's around 10 trillion when adjusted for inflation and what i'm claiming here really is that we are going to enter into a bubble that's larger than the dot com bubble and then once the bubble bursts the come down is yeah is going to be as as drastic as the dot com bubble so there i think the app the market lost 96 percent of the value i think something similar will happen to crypto so it's going to be a crazy ride so, okay. so one question i have is like you know uh do you think this will you know, you very specifically said the market cap of crypto rather than like any specific coin. So do you think this will come mostly from like new assets or will it come from a price increase of existing assets? Or obviously it'll come from some combination, but what, where do you think most of the value will come from? It, it, it has to come from a combination, right? So, I mean, I'm, I'm saying it's like rising 15x, right? So... Bitcoin will rise, but it won't rise 15x. It's going to rise a little less. So, you know, like 9x or 10x. Ethereum probably will rise like 15x. But then there'll be other coins that will rise 100x, 150x. And of course, there'll be completely new coins that will pop out of nowhere and have like $5 billion market caps. Yeah, there'll be a coin that's like three months old and has a multi-billion market cap. All those things are going to happen. And... The aggregate market is going to be like 15 times higher. So I'm, I don't know how much like value Bitcoin captures versus the other things. This is interesting actually listening to you because it kind of makes me want to like almost like rethink my prediction. I mean, so I think one of the things that is going on like right now, is just that it's becoming like an asset class, right? Where you have these like hedge funds that, you know, are buying are buying crypto, or buying Bitcoin at the moment. And I was listening to this podcast a few days, like a week ago, that like kind of really brought this point home, where this was some norm, like non-crypto financial markets investment podcast. And, you know, you listen to the conversation and they were talking about uh, the price of gold and about the price of Bitcoin. And, you know, they said like, oh, gold had rallied less in the last while because Bitcoin had taken market share from gold, you know. So this is like the first time that I've heard kind of Bitcoin become actually something that's like has a role in kind of the larger financial markets. And so I think that's like happening, you know, and you see all these hedge fund investors that have kind of been like the first wave. So now I think, and then everyone has to follow, right? I think it will be in the pension funds, like it would just be in, in a kind of, I don't know, you know, 1%, 2%, 3% or something of like assets. And so I think, I think you have that. And then of course we didn't have that with, with the dot com bubble, right? Where you had this, because this was just equity. Everyone was owning equity anyway, or maybe it was. So that's, I think one thing that's going to drive this like very high and going to be like a huge, this almost unstoppable uh, shift. And then. I think if you compare it with the dot com bubble, I mean, the interesting thing, of course, is, I mean, you said adjusted for inflation, but like, is that inflation is probably not like the actual the inflation of the money supply, right? Because if you look at this gigantic inflation or increase in the total money supply with, you know, COVID and, you know, already financial crisis, and I think this is just going to keep going. Uh, at, at a crazy pace, right? If you can't adjust for that, I, I, actually, I would think that this crypto bubble should become much larger than the dot com bubble, or you know at least maybe maybe relatively adjusted to the money supply at the same level, but probably that would be a lot more than fifteen trillion. So it's kind of actually makes me rethink. It's like maybe this is going to be even much more insane than like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I I think you're right. I, I agree that like I feel Bitcoin has actually found like really solid product market fit at this point. Like I think. I think it's inevitable that Bitcoin like 
become like replaces digital gold. And I, I, I don't know if it's going to be my uh, replaces gold. I don't know if it's my one year prediction. I think it might take two more cycle, like an, w- this cycle plus one more. But I think Bitcoin will flip in gold within the first within the next five years for sure. Yeah, I think like in the current macro environment, I think that Bitcoin just really has this like product market fit. And it's like, you know, it's this this is like thing where in the US where everyone's getting like airdropped money and there's this like crazy inflation or like um, monetary expansion that's happening. It's like, well, okay, now people have the means and the reason to just go buy Bitcoin. And I've noticed like a lot of like a lot of normal people just like talking about Bitcoin now, which is like, you know, it's, it's starting to happen again. On this product market fit idea, one of the things that I found interesting in listening to to some of these kind of more general, you know, macro finance podcasts is that it's really the only exposure that I have to, you know, people in in that world, and it's to see how Bitcoin always gets grouped with gold, and the sort of institutional financial markets have clearly put uh, Bitcoin in the in the store of value use case like no matter what the crypto space says like bitcoin's use case should be if it should be payments it should be whatever for for traditional finance markets it's it's clearly you know a store of value and i wonder you know what that means for you know bitcoin uh bitcoin's future and like how the protocol might evolve or like how that will drive maybe like some technical evolution in the protocol yeah. I mean, I always hate this term store value. I feel like it doesn't mean anything. I feel like a better, like more precise term would be something like a, like a macro hedge asset. Like that, that's what, I guess that's what we mean when we say store value. I mean, everything stores value, but I, I think what, what it is, is it's like, you know, it's a shelling point game, right? Where it's like, currently everyone just agrees on gold as this shelling point where like, if you want to bet against the rest of the war economy, you buy gold. And so that, Act as a shelling point, which naturally then like moves counter to the rest of the economy, and so I think that's like it's just a shelling point game that's going to shift from gold to Bitcoin. And I find these like financial shelling point games really interesting because like one of my friends, he was working at Jane Street in like during the 2016 election, and he was telling me about how like you know during the uh, election night, you know they had a poker, they were playing poker, but on the TV they had this like two screens open. There was one was the predicted uh, prediction markets and the other was the uh, peso US uh, dollar exchange rate because essentially all of Wall Street uh, um, agreed on that market as the shelling point to play their like prediction game on who's going to win the election. And so it's like, it's, it's crazy how much of like financial like markets is just like taking like, you know, acting as pseudo prediction markets given the lack of like, you know, actual prediction markets available. So can we then make a prediction about the Bitcoin price on on uh, on Gnosis uh, built infrastructure? Absolutely. So I I was going to do this tonight. So I was go- actually going to make I was actually going to set up prediction markets on all of the things we talk about right now on Omen. Uh, we can link to it in the show notes. Speaking of the product market fit, I, the next prediction I had there was that the flippening won't happen. Uh, I I don't think that ETH is going to flip in uh, Bitcoin, at, at least this cycle, because I still, th- my opinion is still that Bitcoin has this product market fit, and I still don't know the product market fit of ETH as an asset. I, I'm extremely bullish Ethereum as a platform, and I and I like build on Ethereum, but I don't re- quite fully um, see the role of ETH in the system over time. Yeah, the narrative isn't as coherent so basically, I think there's um, different narratives as to what Ethereum is. And uh, yeah, I think that that's easier for Bitcoin because it's kind of, it is a meme in itself, like gold. Yeah, I, I think like for me, I just think the fundamentals of ETH just aren't the same in the sense that like, I think a lot of the premise of ETH comes from like, you know, especially as we see like EIP-1559 and stuff and like, you know, as a switch to proof of stake, it's basically like trying to tie the value of ETH more directly to the product of Ethereum, which is like this like decentralized computer. But the problem for me is that I, I mean, this will get into a, a topic we'll get into later in the, uh, in the show, but um, I, I, I don't think decentralized compute is a scarce uh, asset. Like I think that like if we want scalability, 
we need decentralized compute to become more widely available. And we're going to see like a massive uh, increase in like layer two and like all sorts of things. And so if decentralized compute is not a scarce commodity, then I don't see why ETH is going to accrue that much value. And yeah, so that's, that's kind of how I see it. The alternative, for my view, though, is I think that there's this narrative that can be played where, you know, Bitcoin is a, another way of thinking of it is it's a fashion statement, right? It's like, if you want to hang out with a certain crowd and you want to, like, show this certain message about yourself, about the type of person you are, you buy Bitcoin and you show off, you know, like, if you're, if you really love eating meat, you buy Bitcoin because it just, like, fits in with your persona, right? I think, like, ETH has the ability to find that sort of fashion statement where I think, Bitcoin is this very like techno pessimistic worldview where it's like, or like it's like techno right wing libertarian fashion statement. While I think Ethereum has the capacity to become a more techno optimist, like left wing fashion statement. And I think that, I think that's like where it might end up going. I love the misuse of the word fashion statement here, by the way. Um, so uh, Sunny, f f what do you think about the thesis that Bitcoin will eventually move to Ethereum for security reasons. I think that's what happened. I, the reason I joined Cosmos was to build the application layer for Bitcoin. Bitcoin is going to flow off the Bitcoin blockchain into uh, many, many chains. Like that, that was the original reason I joined Cosmos like three years ago. I mean, I'm, but I, at that time, I also thought Bitcoin was going to be money. I don't think it's going to be money. I think it's going to be you know, it's just going to be the financial asset that we, we already talked about. Um, so I don't, I, I really think stable coins are really going to also eat ETH's lunch. Like I think a lot of the premise of ETH was like, hey, it's going to be the money of Ethereum. But I think we're going to see that's not going to be true. I think stable coins are going to be the money of Ethereum. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I also have my personal price prediction. So um, it's somewhat in the same vein, but I think out of the top 10 crypto coins by market cap, I think half of those will no longer be in the top 10 by end of year. And the half that I kind of see dropping out, Ripple, not even sure why it's still there, um, Cardano, um, Stellar, Chainlink, and the most controversial, Tether, which also has potentially enormous com uh, uh, implications for the entire DeFi ecosystem and also the use case of crypto as money because it's the but by, by by market cap it's by far the largest uh the far largest stable coin so um, but i think we'll talk about this later do you think usdc will take its place i'm not sure maybe i think something centralized will for sure for the moment so i don't think it's going to be um i don't think it's going to be DAI or something similarly decentralized but i think it's one of my uh, my later predictions um, about Facebook and the DM dollar and so on. Uh, so uh, I'd save it for later. <laughs> well, so one of the predictions I have, which is not contradictory to yours, is I said that Litecoin will stay in the top 10. And I brought this up specifically because when we did our host episode two years ago, Brian and I got into a, a, a mini debate about this, whether Litecoin will be like in the same position as it like five years from then. So it hasn't been five years since then, but it's been two years and Litecoin is still number four on coin market cap. So, and I am convinced that Litecoin will not. Yeah, totally. You, you've been winning that one uh, so <laughs> far. <laughs> like I said, it's all about shelling points and memes. And, and Dogecoin has had a, like a big rally up. So that, that meme is also making some kind of comeback. Yeah. I, I think this, this whole like digital silver meme is going to be very hard to kill and i think it's gonna always like continue to be there yeah okay so we and then i can go to the maybe we have as next thing something i wrote which is basically about like okay now you have this huge bubble and, and then what happens what's kind of like the response from from the system and i i i see kind of a bunch of different stuff so first of all now you're gonna have these crypto businesses competing with like traditional businesses. And the crypto businesses are gonna have like some weird advantages, but also they're just gonna be different and not really fit into the, like the way things are done. And so I think one big thing will be like trying to use regulation to like protect like income and industries and to, to make it like harder for decentralized alternatives to compete. So I think that's gonna be one thing. I think, 
we are also, of course, going to see this huge wealth transfer, right? If this happens, right? There's all these crypto people going to get very rich and like people with other types of assets, they're going to like, you know, lose uh, to some extent. And it's going to be very visible, right? Because a lot of these people are like on Twitter and on Instagram and, you know, you're going to have like the rappers in there and, and the Lambos already. And so I think you have all of that like in your face and then maybe traditional businesses that are becoming like more under attack by the crypto. So I think there's just going to be this backlash. And one avenue where I could see this playing out would be with like taxes as well, where, you know, the, the, it's so complicated, a lot of this crypto stuff that even if you wanted to like perfectly pay your taxes, it's often not totally clear what, what to do. So I, I could see going after like crypto people for like tax evasion, and like, you know, maybe requiring people to like disclose their addresses to the government and then they run like software to look at like all your transactions and kind of, so I could see stuff like that happen, but I just think there's going to be like, you know, a real much deeper kind of backlash to try to. Yeah. So can you be a little bit more specific of like what the type of backlash will be? Do you th- it'll, it will it come mostly from like a government backlash or are you saying there'll also be like a social backlash as well? I, I think there's going to be governance backlash, but kind of driven by, or it will have some public support, I think, because people will, a lot of people will be alienated by like some of the stuff that's going to happen in the crypto space, right? Some people will be inspired and love it, right? But I think there's also going to be a big People were like, oh, is the, what is this anarchist insanity here in this anarchist casino? So we are already seeing some stuff, right? I mean, I think this was also like the, this treasury idea that you can't transfer or, you know, you have to identify when you withdraw from a wallet, they have to identify the counterparty. And so like, how do you deal with smart contracts there, right? I mean, in a way, this is like a direct regulatory attack that makes it harder for a smart contract to compete with a traditional business. So I think we could see a lot of that. And then, yeah, I mean, imagine if, if your tax authorities ask you, Hey, look, you have to give them like all your crypto addresses and then you, and then they could like, I've always thought that taxes will be one of the ways that, you know, you can go. I mean, that's how they put out the phone in jail. No, it's like the taxes. But, but Brian, how do you feel about privacy enhancing technology? Because basically, in, in a way, you can actually, um, you can build or, you know, you can engineer your way out of this, right? That's, I don't know yet, but I think that's going to be kind of one of the battle lines, right? Well, of course, people are then going to build more privacy centric stuff and like some people will use it, others won't. So I, I think that's going to just become one of these big battlegrounds. And I, I could see there also being more of a segmentation where you're going to have like, you know, regulated crypto and then, I mean, we saw that even, I think that just recently that Bitcoin will fine for uh, violating sanctions law, even though it's sort of like an unhosted wallet I think, or it's a multi-sig wallet. So, you know, if you argue, oh, is it an unhosted wallet, hosted wallet? But I think they got some fine because there were some people in Iran or some, some sanctioned country using it. And so now they're okay. They have to say, oh, we have to like, shut this off more, make sure nobody's touching that. And so I could see this sort of segmentation of the industry into a more of a regulated and then more of like offshore, unregulated part. I totally agree with this prediction and it it really overlaps with uh, some of my uh, predictions I wanted to bring up later on. And um, I I think that the regulatory aspect, so a a couple of things, the taxation aspect, I think is, is clear. And at least here in France, we're already seeing some... Uh, version of that. So when you file your taxes in France, you have to declare all exchange accounts. Uh, in fact, you have to de- declare all foreign financial institutions where you have an account. And so crypto exchanges are usually uh, part of those. And I could definitely see that the way that uh, government has been forging policy here, I definitely see uh, addresses being one of the things that's required to disclose in the next couple of years. And then just on the uh, on this idea that you know, part of crypto would be regulated and part may you know stay outside of the regulated space, I think the the Mika regulation makes it pretty clear that that is what could happen. 
in in the Mika regulations, for example, privacy preserving coins are are forbidden. And so privacy preserving coins can't exist. They, they simply can't exist in a regulated space. Now, with regard to other coin, other types of uh, use cases like like stable coins, etc., there's also some question there about whether or not those could exist in a regulated space. And if indeed there are you know some crypto use cases that are regulated and some which are not, there could be sort of this, as you describe it, right, like this separation or what I call like a schism where part of crypto exists in the tradition sort of linked or somehow tied to the traditional finance space it's regulated there are on ramps etc but part of crypto exists outside of that and then there's you know you can extrapolate from there does that mean that there are companies that exist solely in that market and does it create sort of like a, a sort of shadow economy where there's all kinds of other businesses and activities happening but that never interfaces or rarely interfaces or where it's very difficult to interface with the with the traditional finance space the shadow side will probably exist in that case, but do you think it will be a big space or no? Because like the current uh, premise of DeFi is that eventually this stuff is supposed to interface back with like normal people in the real economy, at least in my opinion. But if that if that door is closed, then do you think that like the shadow side will basically like, you know, go back to like 2013 days? Like, yeah, you can use it for dark net stuff, but like that's about it. So currently, like the Wild West of DeFi has this like at least public state like view of like, hey, eventually this stuff is going to be used by normal people. But if regulation comes and like clamps that down, will the Wild West like disappear or will it continue to like grow despite the? Let, let me throw the question back at you. You know, let's 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 assume that Mika goes through as it is today without any without any modification. I'm not so familiar with the with the U.S. Uh, crypto uh, regulatory proposal. I've, I've heard that it's a lot more uh, open to to innovation, etc. But let's let's just let's just presume that like stable coins are illegal, or the stable coins exist outside of the regulated space. Then that means that exchanges won't be able to list them. Then it's it's really up to interpretation whether or not exchanges can deal with coins that have also interacted on smart contracts, you know, would exchanges be able to, to uh, receive liquidity from coins that have went through like the maker smart contracts, for example, uh, or this sort of thing. When, when you say exchanges, you mean centralized exchanges, though, yes, right? Yes, centralized or, exchanges. And regulated exchanges. So basically, in, in a way, I think this co actually comes down to being a philosophical and historical problem. So basically, what good are laws that you can't enforce? Where basically, you cannot make sure that a law is abided by. I think those are laws that kind of get overturned or repealed by history itself. Well, so I mean, I mean, the question though is, uh, yes. Yeah, so, like with dexes and stuff, you can skirt the law. But my, I guess my question is, what percent of the population do we think is going to do that? Well, I think it's a very low percent of the population. I think if like if these things are meant to be, if the vision for DeFi is that DeFi becomes the the underpinnings for 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 finance and where markets are able to operate and like things that we already know and ex that already exist like commodities markets etc like just the stock market and all this can exist on DeFi at, at least the way that Mika is worded uh, it it definitely does seem as though they are trying to bring the parts of of DeFi that already resemble and mimic traditional financial markets things like you know securities things like electronic money. They want to bring that into the traditional finance system and have that be regulated. But all of this other innovative stuff, like all the all the uh, the degen stuff, definitely exists outside of of the regulation, and there's no room for it in the regulation. And so I, I think that, and I, I certainly hope so. And that's the work that <laughs> that we're doing with with our initiatives is that the regulation leaves room for more innovation, but as it's currently drafted, it closes very many doors. So do you think? Will people be willing to, I guess it's like a cultural thing as well, right? So it'll, it'll probably change from like country to country. Like one, obviously the regulation will change country to country, but also just the willingness to break rules probably changes from country to country as well. But also the acceptability of, of breaking rules, right? So basically I remember when I was a kid and basically content sharing started um, and you had Napster and, you know, all of these kind of services. I, I remember they ran these ads saying, 
you wouldn't download a car. And I know that basically with my generation, this, that, this didn't resonate because basically it didn't feel like downloading a song was morally wrong. I mean, look what happened. I mean, people don't really buy entire records anymore. People now pay for streaming services. And this is how, how this is monetized and through, you know, advertising deals and so on. And arguably interacting with privacy preserving crypto is way less enforceable than punishing someone for downloading a song on Napster. So I think in a way the law doesn't stand on its own, but it kind of mimics what people feel is right and what is wrong. And I think that understanding is just going to change over time. But I mean, in, in a way, isn't that actually the music piracy is basically dead now, right? Like, I mean, no one, like barely anyone pirates music. It's all Spotify. And you can think of that. That is sort of like the, you know, you have the traditional music industry with their like selling CDs. Then you have this like this radical thing of like piracy. And then you found some synthesis in like Spotify. And so like maybe, the, I mean, wouldn't that be what happens here as well? You have the traditional finance industry, then you have this like crazy DeFi thing, and then we're going to find like some synthesis in like regulated DeFi. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. And regulated DeFi will kill piracy just like Spotify killed the music. But but only if regulated DeFi isn't so heavily sequestrated that, you know, it doesn't really qualify as the real thing. Yeah, just as with... with uh dismantling of the the music industry but also like the the movie industry to some extent like i think that we will come to some some kind of middle and but you know where where the cursor stands in terms of what that middle looks like i think is is really an unanswered question at the moment i think like one of the most compelling things for me about defi over traditional finance is the ux of it uh, I think the UX of it is like what's really nice. And I think you could say the same thing about the piracy. Like uh, I think the UX of like digital streaming is just way better than going to buy CDs. And so if regulated DeFi can like provide the UX benefits over traditional finance, but I think it's going to actually follow, you know, I, through the course of this conversation, I, I think I've actually been like, I'm very analogizing it to the music industry. I really think that like regulated DeFi is going to probably like wipe like Wild West DeFi, once it provides the UX features to like normal people. But only if you have things like stable coins, for instance, I mean, basically, and privacy preserving coins and so on. So I feel like if the thing that is then called regulated... I mean, my claim is I don't think normal people care about privacy. I think normal people probably don't care about privacy preserving coins. And stable coins will exist. I mean, it depends on how they'll exist. They'll probably be more regulated. Like, you know, maybe it has to be issued by a bank and stuff. But I think that my claim is that normal people don't care whether it's issued by a bank or by, like, Circle. You know, they just care that is the, as long as the UX is as nice as, like, it currently is, I think that's all they care about. And I don't think they care about privacy. But, I mean, the user experience is pretty okay right now on DeFi and it's only going to get better, right? So why would people kind of leave the Wild West to start with? Because the regulation will decrease the UX of Wild West DeFi and make the UX of regulated DeFi better because with the pirating music, you always get those like DMCA complaints every time you pirate them. That's like, that's sort of, a, you can think of that as a negative UX component, right? And so... I'd rather just pay the eight bucks a month to Spotify, get as good of a street of a UX as, or probably better than uh, pirating music. Yeah, I'm. I'm just questioning how good the UX under Micah would be. Yeah, I mean, on the topic of of stable coins, I, I think it's worth noting that at least in Europe, the European Commission is considering crypto euros and. I don't really have well-founded thoughts on this, but maybe this is something that we can launch into into some some debate at some point. But I think that generally there is going to be an opening up of cur currencies are no, in the future are no longer uh, monopolized by countries and by like central banks, right? So uh, I think here in this rundown we're talking about like the the, the Facebook Libra uh, initiatives, etc. And so I think things like Libra are going to exist. And they're going to exist alongside things like a digital euro or a crypto euro. And that is a power shift that resembles the power shift that we saw with the music industry and the, the 
movie industry, you know, 20 years ago, uh, where highly centralized power in those industries was uh, broken apart and now exists in, in all these digital startups like Spotify, etc. We may see a similar sort of disruption of the, of the power monopoly around currencies uh, to favor private currencies like the Libra and, and others. I don't know if this is something you you guys have thought about too. I think governments are going to fight tooth and nail to protect their power here, and I think it's going to be very hard. I'm not saying they're not going to fight, <laughs> but yeah. The record labels didn't have power of taxation and a military. Governments do, and the one thing that they care about above all else is to maintain their like monetary dominance, and I think that like they will fight very hard to prevent someone from trying to disrupt that. I agree with you, Sunny, and I think in the end they will fail. And I think that's, in retrospect, that's going to be the pervasive paradigm shift of our times. Basically, power is diverted away from nation states and to um, companies or other collectives. Why do we think this is the case? Like, like what, what are the triggers that's going to make that the case. Like, you know, historically, we've seen a continuous increase in, like, state power. What's what's going to be the cause of this reversal? I mean, it depends on which scale of history you're looking, right? I mean, basically, the Roman Empire collapsed and, uh, very, you know, state power very much uh, regressed. So I don't think that's not possible anymore. Laws are only good if you can enforce them. And this is kind of segueing into our regulation part of the conversation. But um, so basically, this was this was my one prediction on regulation that I actually alluded to earlier, namely, that if you look at the way that the Facebook proposal for Libra has moved, so in the beginning, it was a basket pegged to Uh, basically, it was a coin packed to a basket of different assets. And under U.S. regulatory pressure, that has kind of s switched to a USD backed stablecoin, right? So I still think that despite the fact that that is probably the best deal that the U.S. can actually get right now, I think they will still clamp down on this. And I think Facebook will lose in this instance. And I think Facebook is very much on a path to demise anyways. But in its wake, I think we will see a stable coin that is global and basket pegged and that will merge into the mainstream and that will be set up, set up such that it will not have the same regulatory exposure as Facebook. And I think this will herald a couple of things, one being the end of the global dominance of the United States, because that is in essence based on controlling the supply of you know, the world's reserve currency. But I think this is also in, in the wider sense, it's also going to mean that nation states will become less powerful. And I would actually argue that nation states are at peak power right now. And I think that corporations and possibly later DAOs and other sort of collective schemes will kind of take that place. I very much agree with that. I think this is like missing partially like the cyclical network effect of the U.S. dollar. Like it seems like your claim here is that the U.S. power comes from the dominance of the U.S. dollar, which is true. But that also is a feat the other direction as well. The power of the U.S. dollar comes from the power of the U.S. government. Like the entire petrodollar system is built on that like idea of like, you know, the U.S. military will enforce it. And so... You know, the reason the U.S. dollar is the like global reserve currency is that you need it to pay for oil. And when you stop someone from trying to if you try to pay for oil and something else, the U.S. military will come and invade you. And so it's like we need to see like what is the um, I need to see what the path is to an alternative. Well, like, one, one, one path is the, the, the decline the, the decline in the, in the demand for oil. I mean, that's one path. I mean, I, I, I don't yeah. have like, specific information. And about, you like, have. Countries like Iran, right, that are basically locked out anyway, you know, they're going to, you know, they can use something like Bitcoin, right? We saw some news there. And then I think you have other countries, you know, like China, like which will be a big oil buyer. Like, do they care about like protecting the US dollar? I'm not sure. But so China's not going to push, China's going to push the yuan, right? Like, you know, what China's doing right now is they're building like 
they have a viable strategy to building a reserve currency. What they're doing is they're going to every country and like saying, hey, we'll fund your ports as long as all imports and exports from here are denominated in RMB. That's like a viable path. Yes, but I mean, that, that actually that puts pressure on the dollar, right? I mean, so basically that, that fragments the system even more. Yeah, exactly. You're going to have alternatives, right? You can basically say, oh, we're going to get yarn from China or like you can get like maybe do something with Bitcoin with Iran. And then I think there will be others that are also like, like Russia, I'm sure is going to be happy to deal deals like outside of the dollar system. So I don't think that they're going to, the military is going to be able to sort of like maintain the, the dominance of the dollar. I think there is a big shelling point around the dollar, right? Where everyone keeps their accounts in that and there's liquidity in that. And I think that's, of course, going to be more sticky. But in the end, I, I don't know about the dollar. I, I would guess it's still some ways away until we are going to see the dollar kind of lose its status. I would guess that's not going to happen in like this bull run, but, you know, maybe like five, ten years from now. Maybe I can I can step in like when I hear all of you talking, I think I would like to actually someday categorize your predictions into like a framework. So if you think of state power, like the what does the state want? State doesn't want one thing, it wants multiple things, right? So maybe it wants to preserve its monetary sovereignty over their own population, meaning US government wants their population to transact in US dollars. So that's one thing they want. The second thing they want is tax collection, which is making tax evasion really hard via crypto. The the third thing they want is, which is like preserving the market structure, right? Which, which is like the SEC wants that if there's a crypto coin, there's no information asymmetry vis-a-vis -vis the crypto coin. So they want to preserve market structure. And then the, the, the fourth thing is uh, they want surveillance. Surveillance comes in more from a law enforcement. So it could be that the government wants four things, four major things, so we could identify a different number. Maybe in the future, they will get some of these things from crypto, but on the others, they will fail to get what they want. So, you know, like you could imagine different futures. There's one future in which the government gets their, this surveillance capability. So they're able to surveil everything way better than they are able to today via crypto but they lose their monetary power. I mean, the coins being transacted are not US dollars, but they are surveilled really well. That's one kind of future. But the different kind of future is they preserve the monetary sovereignty, but lose their surveillance power. So, you know, like the future has like different outcomes based on which of these powers is accentuated for the government and which of the powers is weakened for the state. And all of you are like on like different spectrums of some of you are advocating for a particular thing will be strengthened and another particular thing will be weakened and like that's the sort of difference in your predictions. So maybe we can actually like classify your predictions using some model like that. Right. I think that I think that's actually a really good way of putting it. I think personally that for me, I think the surveillance is something that will be harder for them to enforce. And I think they know that. And I think which is why maintaining the monetary dominance is something that they can do more easily. It's like surveillance is like this hard problem where you have to have like monitor literally everything. But like with monetary dominance, it's not like it's something you can like kind of enforce, not by like needing visibility into the entire thing, but just this like larger thing where you like, I don't know how to describe it exactly, but yeah, I don't know. Maybe someone else can bring it. In a way, you actually have that now, right? I mean, so basically, cash is to a large extent not traceable, and um, you still have monetary dominance as as a nation state. So, in summary, I think what we can say is that with with some with some amount of certainty is that uh, crypto markets are going to see a pretty significant increase in prices uh, this year, and I think we all uh, welcome that. And but at the same time, the attention that will that that will bring to crypto may, in fact, cause the space to regress in terms of its ability to innovate as freely as it has, you know, in the last like three years since the last bull run. Um, would you say that that's would you guys agree that that is sort of the 
overlying trend that we should expect in the next year? I do think we will see a large amount of regulatory pushback, but I do think, I mean, this is kind of where, where, where we disagreed on the episode, right? So whether whether this will actually mean that um, a large proportion of the ecosystem will become regulatorily compliant um, or whether there will still be a large unregulated part. And I think the ecosystem will very much uh, rally to avoid being regulated in an overly transgressive way. I mean, if you if we bring it back to the just kind of brief, I just want to briefly bring it back to this analogy, if we bring it back to the to the to the piracy and like music download example, I mean, that still exists. It, it still exists in, in massive scale. There are still, you know, terror, like hundreds of terabytes of day, probably even thousands of terabytes per day of music and movies being uh, downloaded and uh, that's despite governments trying to to stop it. It just doesn't interface with any regulated uh, with any regulated entities. I, I I don't know what that how that overlaps to in the crypto space, but it might be one indication that there can still be a sort of wild west of crypto while a lot of uh, the innovation that's come in the last few years and that will continue to come will be sucked into a, a, a regulated space. I mean, it it really might, it depends on what the regulated alternative looks like, right? So basically, if you think back to iTunes, where basically you could buy any song for 99 cents, um, I mean, I, I don't even know whether that still exists. I haven't seen iTunes in years. So I, I assume that it kind of was probably discontinued because the people didn't like it enough or people, it, it wasn't appealing enough for people to stop pirating, right? right? Well, better alternatives came around. Exactly, because better alternatives came around. And so I think unless the regulated open finance or DeFi space is as attractive as the unregulated one, I think it's not going to happen and people are going to find and engineer ways around it. All right, cool. Thanks to all of you. And I think we can all agree that this is... So you guys have... Our audience uh, has really, I think over the years, like asked for us to do more of these. And uh, what we've all agreed on here, I think, is that we'll uh, try to do these at least once a quarter because uh, um, you guys like them. And also, like, we think they're really fun. And we are good guests. So Yes, <laughs> also. So with that, um, Happy New Year to everybody. And we'll see you on the Internet. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.